What's up, Finnegan's Wake people? We're back with another pulse-pounding episode of Finnegan's Wake for Beginners with your host, Adam Savage, me. And today we're looking at a book called A Skeleton Key to Finnegan's Wake by Joseph Campbell in big letters and then Edward, no, Henry Morton Robinson in little letters because nobody knows who he is anymore. So I guess this was the first book, I think, that Joseph Campbell published and it came out in, I want to say, 44, which, uh, yeah, 44 originally, just three years after Finnegan's Way. Can you imagine the amount of times that Henry um, Morton Robinson and Joseph Campbell went through the uh, Finnegan's Wake in those three years so that they could come up with a fat book nearly as long, <laughs> nearly as long as the book itself. It's fitting. No, that's not true. 362 pages or something. Uh, I did not read it all. I have not read all this. So caveat, amateur, fire beware or something. And um, I wanted to. I, that was my intention when I picked up this book because I thought, hey, a skeleton key to Finnegan's Wake. That sounds like a good way to start Finnegan's Wake. And I was kind of familiar with some of the information. I, I don't come to Finnegan's Wake completely cold. I've looked into it over the years enough that I kind of have some ideas so that, that I can't really come to this as an absolute beginner. But I tried to envision a beginner's mind when approaching Finnegan's Wake. And I thought maybe this would be a good starting point because it, it seems to, you know, unlocking Joyce's masterwork, unlocking it like a key, like the title says, a skeleton key. Um, I don't know if you need a skeleton key if you're just opening one thing, like, uh, you can just call it a key, right? <laughs> skeleton key, isn't that the things like in video games where you can open any lock? I don't even know if those exist. Anyways, what I did read that I liked, um, let, let me talk a little about what this book is. So first, it starts off with kind of a general conceptual ideas. They do talk about characters. I know we talked before in this series about can we find characters in Finnegan's Wake? Their take is yes, that we can't find these characters. Here comes everybody, or Humphrey Chimpton, Earwicker, HCE, uh, his wife, Anna Olivia, Plural Bell, ALP, their sons, Shem and Sean, Shem the penman, who's kind of based on James Joyce, and Sean the other one, and their daughter, uh, what's her name? Isolt. That's right. Isolt. So those are kind of the main characters that we see in this family in Finnegan's Wake, and they do talk about that. That's kind of the intro material. And then there's a, what I thought was the most useful in this book was the kind of brief outline, which is, let me show you. It's, um, so the book has four, Finnegan's Wake has four big sections based on this book that I haven't read yet, but I'm, I'm familiar with. The gist of it is that um, Gian Battista Vico, I think I'm saying that right, because G I A, you say, ja, ja, yeah, Giardino, ja, yeah, so not Gian, it's Gian Battista Vico. I believe that. I should ask, I have, I have an Italian language partner, I should ask um, the pronunciation. So, anyways, uh, what was I talking about? The sections. Okay, so this is the most useful part I found this synopsis and demonstration in which. The four books are described. Book one, the book of the parents, so Anna Olivia Plurabel and H.C. Humphrey Chim Chimpton Earwicker and his many other names. Um, so each of these is, is, has a very brief summary, just like a paragraph. Finnegan's Fall, chapter one. Chapter two, H.C.E. his agnomen and reputation. There's this crime that's mysterious. What happens in Phoenix Park in... Dublin. Some crime occurs in which HCE, there's all these rumors about him and what he did. Uh, it seems to be somehow sexual in nature. I think uh, women or, I don't know, they kind of see him or it's very mysterious. That's kind of one of the key ideas that I'm getting about Fitting His Wake is that the telling of things is uh, often transmitted very sloppily and in a very confused way. There's a term, I think it's in Fitting His Wake, I heard it somewhere, gossipocracy. And when I think about our age of cancel culture and um, you know Twitter and everybody, I think we do live in this gossipocracy. If, I'm not saying that Fitting His Wake is a direct transmission of the future, but Joyce did know about media and understand 
its goal was to create this gossipocracy or I'm, I don't know, I'm getting ahead of myself. His trial and incarceration. So HCE, he gets thrown in jail or something. And uh, his, I've read some of these sections too, but I, at the time, if you had asked me to come up with a summary like this, I could not do that based on the readings that I've done. Uh, his trial and incarceration. Chapter 4, HCE, his demise and resurrection. His demise and resurrection. Interesting. The Manifesto of ALP and Olivia Pluribel. So again, these are, this is the book of the parents. Chapter 6, Riddles, the personages, pers personages of the Manifesto. Uh, I think this is getting back to these like archetypal forms. So Finnegan, or the, the fall, the great fall into matter of, or into character of personality, all these personalities that inhabit our planet, here comes everybody. It's this very Kabbalistic notion of, if you see in the tree of life, um, I don't claim to be an expert on Hermetic Kabbalah, but I do at least have one book somewhere. Uh, I don't have the Tree of Life to show you, but um, you might want to look into that information. The book I'm reading that I like, well, Promethea, that comic series really got me into Hermetic Kabbalah, but the book I'm reading is by Will Parfit, and he has several books, but the one I have is called The New Living Kabbalah. Anyways, back to um, the next part, chapter 7, Shem the Penman. The washers of the Ford. I hope this video isn't as confused as <laughs> some of this this book can seem. I'm just trying to give you some information. I'm going to go much further detail as we go on. I'm going to go through each of these sections one at a time like I did in my Ulysses course, but for now I just kind of want to throw some ideas your way and kind of show you what I'm kind of picking up as I go along. The washers at the Ford. That's kind of a famous section. Um, one thing in this book they did talk about is some of the most easy sections to get started with, and they suggest Shem the Penman, which is based on Joyce's own autobiography up to that point. So in the, the standard edition, I think it starts on page 169, Shem the Penman, that section. Okay, so washes the form. That, those are the book one sections. And then book two, the book of the sons. So this is a transition into a different Viconian age. John Battista Vico, and I'm not familiar enough with those ages. I want to say it's like, it starts like the age of the gods. I, I'm getting it wrong. Like, then the age of the, like, kings and monarchy, and then democracy, and then chaos. I could be totally wrong on that. I'll go into more detail, I promise. My hand will. Anyways, Book of the Suns, The Children's Hour. I haven't read this, a lot of these sections. The Study Period, Triv and Quad. There's a section I've seen that has... Um, you really need to, if you buy a, an ebook edition or something, you need to make sure it's formatted right because it's, it's, there's uh, footnotes and there's kind of dual parallel um, text going on. Tavernry in Feast, chapter three, Bride, Ship, and Gauls. And then book three, the Book of the People. So I think this is the more democracy age of Vico. Uh, Sean before the people. Sean is the not penman, he's, um, <laughs> and there's some interesting pun names. So in chapter two, John, he becomes J-A-U-N, and uh, they compare him to Don Juan from, um, you know, the Don, Don Juan, that legend, but Don Juan is the title of the uh, Lord Byron poem. And there's all kinds of different versions of the Don Juan story, uh, Don Giovanni by the Mozart opera and so on. Uh, Yawn under inquest. He becomes Yawn. I'm not clear what that is about. HCE and ALP, their bed of trial. And then book four, Recorso, Recorso which is all leading back up to this, the loop back to the beginning, because the book is cyclical in form. So this was the most helpful part of this book for me. I thought those were very simple and concise. Obviously, a lot of details are left out, but they're good for starting. I, I read this section, these sections twice. I'll, maybe, I'll probably read them again at some point down the line. Because uh, then the, the next part is where it starts to kind of lose me because I, and I, I kind of question the utility of this book for a beginner when it actually gets into the main sections because there are, I thought it was going to be more of a summary too, but it's actually just 
a conversion of a lot of the text from Finnegan's Wake into a slightly more standardized English. Uh, but let me just read it a little bit. So the cad, swift to make errors, stern to check himself, realizing that he was here having to do with a type of Paleolithic caveman ethics, bade the man good morrow, a little taken aback all the same, that was all the cloth. Okay, so, so you can see that uh, this is not exactly the easy uh, un to understand. Like, okay, the beginning part with the summaries, let me read that, some of that. A half trustworthy account is given of the earliest days of HCE and how he came by his curious name. Pretty simple and straightforward reading, right? That's pretty easy. But the rest of the book, it's just, you know, it's, it's practically just one shade slightly easier, just very slightly easier than the book itself. Can you do her numb? asks Dolph, the truveler, suspecting the answer. No. I can't. Can you nini? asks Neb. Okay, so you're, you're like practically lost as you are reading Finnegan's Wake. So at this point I decided, I read, I don't know how many pages of that, 40, 50 pages, and I said, okay, I wasn't enjoying this, and I wasn't really, I didn't feel like I was gaining any structural ground or understanding, so I decided to stop at that book. So can I recommend this book for a beginner? Just the beginning part. Um, maybe go into a library or find a PDF or something online and read the first, uh, in this edition, you know, read until about page 35, and then you're, you're, you're done, and then move on to other books. I have some other resources I've been looking at that I'm going to talk about in future videos, but for now I just wanted to touch on this because I think a lot of people, when they start Finnegan's Wake, this is one of the most well-known books about Finnegan's Wake, summarizing it. Um, we have heard in this course about other books. Uh, one uh, that I found that is extremely rare and hard to find, but I did find one at the university library. The problem is it's, it's a pretty thick book and I don't have, I have no means of checking it out, so I'd have to read it in the library, or at least skim through it. But maybe I'll take a look or maybe I can somehow pilfer it from the library and then, not to steal it, but just to borrow it and then return it at some future date. I don't know, we'll see. <laughs>